Hi everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. I know it's the last day. People are running low on energy, so even for a 10:30 session, and it's sometimes hard to get moving. Um, it's honestly really exciting for me to be here. It's the first time in this beautiful city, so it's really great to experience the culture and be able to share a lot with you guys. Talk about Unreal, talk about EOS, talk about food, all this good stuff. Um, my name is James White. I'm a technical account manager at Epic. My role is really on supporting partners and really the initial job was to support those that were looking at using Epic Online services as well as shipping their game on the Epic Game Store. So troubleshooting any issues they have, helping them adopt best practices. Recently, we've also been rolled officially under, under the under Unreal Engine umbrella. So now my team is really looking at any studios that any game studios that are using Epic Tech we're probably gonna be involved in some way in terms of the technical relationship. Um, and today, I'm really excited to talk about EOS. It's really been my passion as I've been with Epic for the last four years. And what we're hoping today is to take what we've been doing. Uh, historically, it's been kind of a one-on-one -on -one session of what is EOS, and we're trying to level it up a little bit. Though, kind of the idea is you've been, you're familiar with it, but maybe you want to get started or you're just getting started and you want to avoid some common pitfalls, we want to cover those things today. Hopefully save you some time, save some support load, let you build better games and better products faster and sooner. Um, for those of you that didn't attend my GDC talk, I wanted I like to start with a little bit of history, talking about what's brought us to this point, what we're trying to do, uh, and I'll explain a little bit as to why later. From the beginning, Epic has always adhered to a core central idea. We like to build products, dog food them, learn from them, and then share what we've learned with others. Uh, this philosophy is really part of our identity. It allows us to enhance our products and helps us provide something that is better for you so that you can spend less time wondering about challenges and spend more time building better games. Uh, for instance, from Unreal Tournament, we got the Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine represented what we learned in building our own games, and then we thought, that you as developers would benefit from those experiences. And as, o as we've grown over the years, we've remained committed to that kind of approach. Take something we've learned, ship it over the wall, and try and give you something better in return. What started with Unreal Engine has evolved into a suite of tools that span a lot of industries and disciplines, all aimed at fostering and building creativity. Uh, it's sometimes easy to forget that Epic Games is not just a game studio, but it's actually a tools company dedicated to maximizing your productivity. Uh, with the launch of the Epic Game Store in 2018 and our suite of services available, we support the growth and success of creators. We believe the idea that when, we, when you succeed, we succeed, and we really hope to be your home for digital content creation, wherever that may be. Uh, whether you're new to Epic as a whole, or you've been with us from the beginning, we're excited to have you along for this journey, and we really appreciate all the support that you've given over the years. All right, to start and kind of lay a base ground, how many of you are completely unfamiliar with Epic Online Services? As in, maybe you've heard the term, but you've never opened the SDK before. Got a few? That's fine. Good. We'll get you up. How many of you have at least dabbled with it a bit? Great, and then how many of you feel like you've been using it for a while and you're just wanting a refresher course? Got a couple? Good. All right, we've got a, we've got a nice little spread. That's fine. For those of you that are new to this, Epic Online Services is a free, open, and modular suite of tools that are back-end services that cover core functionality to power your game. These services are based on the matchmaking and cross-platform features that we developed for Fortnite, and then, again, threw it over the wall, thought you'd probably benefit from similar concepts, and provided those for you. As I mentioned, the goal is to take what we've learned and make it easier for you to solve problems that we've already done so that you can build great games. So that's the idea. A suite of common services which, you've, which have already been battle tested and proven to work at scale, and then you integrate those into your own game. This ideally will help you streamline and simplify uh, the parts of your development process and allow you to spend less time ensuring things like matchmaking are working and spend more time building out that core game loop. And the best part is it's available for free. This is a question that's commonly asked, and I've even heard it this week, how could that be possible? Because we at Epic don't just do things for profit, we do things because we believe in building better communities and better developer ecosystems. We want to work with you. We want you to succeed. It builds a better, pro a builder, it builds a better experience for people as a whole when everyone succeeds. A good example of this from the start of the year is actually Pal World. If you're not familiar with Pal World, I hope you are, but a game that released early in January um, and just saw 
meteoric, unprecedented success. Um, it was developed by a very small team using Unreal Engine and EOS, and it surpassed the expectations of anyone and just kind of skyrocketed. As it was shipping, it started running into some issues with their back end, and we got a call from the team in need of assistance due to issues with their matchmaking, just not being able to keep up with the demand. Um, while certainly a stressful time, it was an exciting time for everyone, and we were able to jump on support calls, emails with them, and work with them to identify issues, help streamline the back end, and also improve our own services just to harden everything to watch it be one of the highest and most successful games on Steam that still, I think, stands number two or number three in terms of peak CCU of all time. We benefited, they benefited, the game did well, and it's been doing well since. Um, breaking down what EOS is, you can think of it as essentially two main service stacks, the game services stack and the account services. These are designed with the key functionalities that you would probably consider with how you plan your game. How can we support our multiplayer experience? What can we do to moderate player behavior? How do we enable players to have quick social inter interactions and connections so that they can build that, that, uh, that support structure and that friend group to keep them sticky and tied to the game? These are the areas that we're trying to support with EOS. On this left side of the, of the screen, um, game services is going to be that core game loop functionality, matchmaking, voice chat, achievement tracking, progression. There's also things like anti-cheat tools, player reporting, and ticketing. One thing that's worth noting with the game services stack is all that player data that's generated under this stack is owned by you, not us. We process that data, but you own that data and how it's used. Right side, the account services, this is tying into the Epic ecosystem and the Epic social graph. So these are social features with Epic accounts, secure authentication, your friend list, your management of your friends, invites, social overlay, and then just presence and information about the game or about the player to help you build communities. Um, what's nice about the Epic's account services is it's for titles that need some sort of account system, but maybe don't want to build their own. You've got the high tier with the Ubisofts and the Battle.nets that they have their own account, and then you've got the smaller mid-tier titles that need some sort of way to authenticate. You can leverage Epic account services, so you, again, don't need to build that, and you can focus on that core game loop. Bottom underneath it all, part of the EOS SDK is just the integration layer into the Epic Game Store. If you choose to ship on the Epic Game Store, we hope you would like to, you, that's going to cover those things like e-com integration, um, and just management of, of your ownership and catalog and being able to tie into store services. Finally, kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about here, but I would call it a sister product. We also have kids web services, which provides things like parental consent flows, child verification that you can integrate into your game as well, especially if you're looking to support and deal with uh, minors. So something to work, that's not strictly part of EOS, but definitely works alongside it and something that if you're looking for, we can try and connect you with the right people. With everything we offer, it's worth noting that Epic Online Services is about choice. It was built with modularity in mind. You pick and choose what you need and you decide that based on the requirements of your game. Do you need to integrate voice chat? There's EOS Voice. Do you want an anti-cheat solution for your upcoming shooter? Well, Easy Anti-Cheat's a great choice there. Uh, do you need, again, that central account system for identity management so players can all log in with one account no matter where they go? Great, Epic Auth. Don't build it yourself when there's something that already works. Also, we have integration with all of the major platform providers. Uh, so Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, uh, any of those are supported. So with EOS, you can take any of those identity services and log into the back end. It's not just a Epic account to Epic Online Services. You could have your game only ship on Xbox, use EOS as your backend. Uh, again, Pal World uses Steam, Steam and Xbox, right? They're, they're not using Epic accounts, it's all Xbox and Steam players. And then really any account system that supports OpenID can be integrated into that. We treat all of them the same. It's all just external identities that are logged in and it should be largely transparent to players. So you choose to use EOS and it's just something that's running in the backend. Players don't need to know how that works and it shouldn't be visible to them. It's also platform agnostic. Again, PC, console, mobile, wherever you are, we should be available for you. Uh, this gives you one common cross-platform tool stack that you can use to build your game with the ability to also hook into the native platform SDKs as well. Common tooling, cross-code, cross means that you can build your game faster and deliver a common experience for your players no matter where they are. It's also worth mentioning, I know this is Unreal Fest, but EOS is not actually tied to any specific engine. It's supported with, there's SDKs supported in C and C Sharp, and then there's plugins obviously available for 
uh, Unreal Engine as well as Unity. I'll talk about the OSS later. Um, but we're actually seeing a growth of community-developed plugins as well. Earlier this year, the Game Maker Engine posted a blog post about how they actually have SDK support and showcased a few of the titles that they were doing. So it's great to see that people are wanting to use EOS, and through time, it's going to become easy and easier to use it with your engine of choice. Uh, and that helps people because it will help the SDK conform to whatever development patterns that engine may have and make it easier to integrate. Again. You don't need to use Unreal Engine to use Epic Online Services, and you don't need to use Epic Online Services if you are using Unreal Engine, but it's all the same family, so hopefully they'll be easier for you to play with both. All right, summarizing everything we've talked about so that we kind of have that base ground level, Epic Online Services is a flexible, modular, cross-platform multi-engine SDK that can be integrated into your game and workflow. It's platform agnostic, creating a common backend for your game makes it easier for you to ship on the platform of your choice or whatever storefront and reach a wider audience with your game. You're in control of your data and the player data and how it's used. And this helps you create unique experiences and focus on those experiences and some hopefully simplifies your implementation process. We take care of the technical bits, you create a great experience for your players. And then you can get valuable insights through your players through game operations and reporting. And then it's modular, pick and choose what you need. All right. Now let's talk about the focus of today's talk. We've got the base level. Now we're gonna dig into what I would say are common things that are maybe confusing for people that are first getting started with EOS or common areas that we just see issues as people are getting on board. Um, hopefully this will save you some time. Um, what, we've do, what we've done with the rest of this is kind of grouped all of these common areas into technical zones or technical best practices based on categories of where you would encounter them. The implementation details of a lot of this will vary game by game, so I'm not going to dig deep into like code specifics, but the concepts will still apply. To get started, let's talk about just the dev portal, how you get your things set up in the back end. All right, to review of how the dev portal works, and this is actually one of those critical things, because if you're coming from other ecosystems, it may be new or confusing. You start out with an organization, you create your user organization, and especially now, because we've consolidated a lot, you're gonna see this as you're managing your UE licenses, you're working in the same dev portal and the same setup. The organization is where you create one or more products, which will probably represent your game, and this will be how you house all of your product-specific information. A product will have what we call a sandbox. A sandbox is going to be how you store your identity configuration, so if you're supporting Xbox, Epic account, Steam login, you do that per sandbox, as well as any artifact or catalog-based data. So this is where you upload your binaries to, if you're shipping on the Epic Game Store, um, setting up offers and entitlements, all of that is tied to the sandbox. Specific to EOS, a sandbox can have one or more deployments, and deployments is how data is stored for EOS-based stuff. So this is going to be how your Users are set up. If you've got lobbies and matchmaking, it's based on the deployment you use, achievement progress, stats, all of that is tied to the deployment specifically. When you set up all of this, you need a way to access it. And that's how you're going to, that's when you're going to configure clients. Clients are basically your permissions for an application. When you authenticate with the SDK, the client tells the back end, what does this user have permission to do? So I'll talk about this a bit later, but you'll define permissions for your clients, say accessing things like the friends list, checking achievement progress, joining a session. So again, I'll talk about it a bit later, but you'll want to decide, you know, is this being run for my game? What permissions do I want to have there? Or is this gonna be run for my back end? And then finally, talk a little bit about it. For a given product, you'll also configure Epic account services if you're using Epic login. Um, you wouldn't necessarily about this about, worry about this on other platforms but hopefully you would consider it, especially if you have a need of an identity service, because again, this is how you access friends, user profile, presence, all of that for a player is like a common experience that you can use. Um, digging into details, I mentioned game service data is per deployment. So if you don't want to necessarily have data mix or have achievements or leaderboards kind of get propagated in your retail version, make sure you set up deployments for testing and have all that data per, per deployment. You can create your deployments in the dev portal and you can actually make them public or private. Public or private scope basically means, can anyone access this ecosystem or do they have to be configured with uh, permissions? And I'll talk about how to set that up in a second. Um, if you're using the, if you're publishing on the Epic Game Store, it's worth noting that 
we actually define three environments for you, a dev stage and live environment, and they all come by default with their own deployments. So that gives you three environments that you can work from that kind of also help segregate things. So depending on what you're doing, this may or may not be something you have to cognizantly concern about, concern yourself with, but just be aware that we have this segregation of data and you'll want to make sure to keep that in mind. If you're using EOS just for your game and you're not necessarily shipping on the store, creating multiple deployments under your live sandbox will be perfectly fine. Uh, okay, so I talked about how to do private and public. This is something that is going to be more and more relevant, especially as you work in these dev and stage environments, the Epic Games Store, which have private scope by default. You have two ways to access that data. Either you're a member of that developer organization, you've added them, or if you're doing external testing or your you know, friends and family closed loop testing that you haven't quite pushed alive, player groups are your best friend. Pair, player groups are configured to environments to allow listed users to access those environments. Uh, what's worth noting is that player groups support a variety of identity providers, but it's you use the identity ID, so don't use the username or an email. Just make sure you're uploading the user IDs based on whatever platform you're in. And again, whatever we support, Xbox, OpenID, um, PlayStation, Epic account, whatever that is, you create lists, you create environments that you target, and you can support them. Um, tied to this, but it's worth mentioning, if you're using Epic accounts, uh, player groups isn't sufficient enough. You'll also need to make sure that the Epic account services is configured uh, and that you have your brand verification setting. Otherwise, those users wouldn't be able to be get access. So keep player scopes and player groups in mind. This is a pretty important part of that cycle as you want to manage users. Something also worth mentioning tied to this process of deployments and sandboxes, but if you're shipping on our store, one of the things that we actually can provide for you is when you launch your artifact, the command line from the launcher will tell you what environment it's launched from, and you can set a default deployment ID. What this really me means is you can have a single artifact and basically grab the sandbox and deployment ID from the command line args to initialize your game. That way, as you push your artifact from dev to stage to live, it will programmatically automatically choose the correct environment that it's being launched from. We see from time to time titles that will forget this and they'll hard code their, hard code their IDs, and then they'll ship live with private IDs and then come to us saying, why aren't achievements working? Why can't my players authenticate? And it's because it's pointing to the wrong environment. Do something like this, programmatically grab that data. It will make your life so much easier. One more thing, I talked about it a little bit, but when you're setting up your client policies, it's good to keep this in mind that there's two essentially scopes of client policies, user-based, or user list, and it's all based on, let's see if I can find it, this little box right over here, user acquired. User acquired clicking that box will say that I need an authenticated user to, act, to, to initialize this client. And that's really good for when you load your local game and there's operations that are very specific to user authenticated operations that, that you need to do. And so when you do that, you'll probably want to have a more li limited set of permissions you, because the client has access to it. So you ask yourself, what am I okay with my local player being able to do? Especially when you consider things like bad actors, what permissions do you want, potentially want to limit them from having access to? User list clients are going to be something that you'd use on a secure server. So doing uh, a catalog verification or running, maybe you're doing clawbacks for, for potential refunds or just operations that are bulk operations across the board, then you would do client-based authentication and not require a user and that way multiple people can be sent to that same and it can run operations on all players. So keep those things in mind. It's something that I occasionally get emails about from studios that they're not considering this and they'll report to me something like, hey, I have a user permission not found error and it's because the operation they're trying to do either wasn't included in the client policy or they're using the wrong type of policy. So really important to look at hey, what permissions am I giving the local user? What permissions do I need for my server? And how am I authenticating them? Final thing, this one's a fun one and probably one of the areas that I see the most in terms of confusion is specific to the Epic Game Store and how we organize our, um, our catalog information and our entitlement and ownership information. When it comes to the EOS SDK and the store, there are two core functions that are used to determine what a player has access to. There's the EOS query ownership function and query entitlements function. 
They look similar, but they're actually used in different scenarios. Query ownership is used for durable goods. It's the ability to traverse an ownership hierarchy. So you have something like a deluxe edition that grants a hat. Query ownership can look at all those things and say, yes, the player owns a hat. Query entitlements is used for consumable goods generally. You can think of it like a receipt of purchase. For example, if your game has some sort of gold pack that you can buy, and I buy three versions, I buy that gold pack three times, my account will have three unique entitlements for that gold pack granted onto my account. Query entitlements can list them all so that you can iterate through them, redeem them, and award them appropriately. But all it knows about is that essential receipt of purchase. A player owns multiple entitlements for gold pack. Do something with it. So I want to talk about this because we get a lot of cases where game is launched and they say players can't access the items that they purchased. And it's probably because they're using the wrong query method. So here's a scenario that we can give. In the simple case, we've got some sort of thing that I buy and it's a base game. In this case, both operations will work. I bought the base game. I have an entitlement for the base game. Query ownership says yes. Query entitlement says yes. Everything is happy-go-lucky. You just list the entitlements. It's all there. But where it gets confusing is the next step. I buy the deluxe edition of a game. It includes some sort of skin in the base game of the account. Query entitlements just says, yes, the player owns the deluxe edition of the game. You would not see any entitlement associated with the skin or the base game. But query ownership, again, walks this hierarchy and will be able to say, yes, the player owns these individual items. So keep this in mind when you're setting up your, your e-com and your ownership within your game. You should probably be using query ownership in most cases, unless you have consumable goods or repurchasable goods, in which case query entitlements is the operation you'd be looking for. There's edge cases. Sometimes an item will offer both. But I want to break this down because this is probably one of the more common issues that we see with people integrating on the store. All right, that's e-com. Let's talk about authentication. I mentioned at the beginning that EOS is broken into game services and account services. And one of the big differences is both have some form of authentication method. Either you're logging into an Epic account or you're logging into the EOS backend. Game services is used with multiple account systems or identity providers and treats the identity providers the same. Where it gets confusing is these two services have very similar login flows, a concept of logging in and the concept of linking accounts. So I wanted to break them down so you understand how those work. With Epic Auth, you have the ability to log into an Epic account. And what we do support is actually configuring external identity providers as a way to log into the Epic account. So you've probably seen this, especially if you've played any of our first party titles, like Fortnite or Rocket League, on something other than the Epic Games launcher, like Xbox or PlayStation, where it says, hey, log in with your PlayStation identity into your Epic account. I authorize PlayStation identity to be used. So in this case, it says, I can take external identities and log into the Epic account. Great. What's different about it is EOS Connect says, take an identity provider and return this, what we call a platform agnostic PUID to log into the EOS backend. The confusion comes in where it goes, I log into my Epic account, and I've authorized that. I log in to the EOS backend with my Epic account. Why can't the EOS backend learn about, know about my Xbox thing? my Xbox account. And the reason is because EOS Connect treats all identity providers the same and just sees, I know about an Epic account and I've associated a product user ID with the backend. EOS Connect similarly has this concept of linking accounts, but in this case it says multiple identity providers are associated with the same PUID. So it becomes these kind of tree relationships, but I want you to keep them essentially separate. The core idea is whatever identity I log into the Epic backend, that's a one-to-one -one relationship with a PUID and you can have multiple identities associated with that PUID, but separate that from I've logged into an Epic account. So yes, that theoretically means you have two login flows in your game. Log into an Epic account, log into the EOS backend. Something that's commonly confused, but it's worth breaking out because login and login link account are the same calls, but they do different things. All right, some best practices when it comes to handling this, especially when it comes to crossplay, and I'll talk about crossplay in a bit. One, and I actually had this conversation multiple times, I want to stress it's not required to use Epic accounts with EOS, which also means unless you are intentionally designing your game to do so, you don't need to force Epic accounts on your players if you use it as an optional login. 
the best way to do it, and you've probably seen this with a lot of PC titles, where you have an option to log into the Epic account to access the social graph so you can have this cross-platform experience. If you choose to do so, what we strongly recommend is make it an optional login that you have within your game based on some sort of Boolean or button that says log into Epic account. What we often see that causes confusion is when the game, maybe by, def by accident or by intent, does a login automatically and causes a prompt for the player to log into their Epic account, which especially on Steam will confuse players that says, why is this Steam game forcing an Epic account on me? That usually doesn't go down well. Probably what's happening under the hood is the game is doing that Epic auth linking and saying, hey, is there an Epic account associated with the Steam account? Log into the Epic account, which is great, but maybe query the player first and say, do you want to log in? Great, and then subsequently on future launches, if they've enabled that setting, do the automatic login. We do recommend external account linking into an Epic account because it makes for a silent login flow. That way you take the Steam app ticket or the Xbox, Xbox access token and logs in instead of querying for their username and password. Um, yeah. So keep those things in mind and just make sure, don't assume that because the, just because those external identities are linked that the player has granted consent to your game. One thing that's worth noting as well with the Epic Game Store is you can actually just use an exchange code that's passed to you from the launcher. The launcher actually provides a lot of information, automatic login through an exchange code, um, deployment ID and sandbox ID. We see some people kind of overlook that and then prompt for username and password every time they log in, which is weird because you're in the launcher, you have an authenticated user, why not just use that same credential for getting access to that user? Finally, the last thing I wanna talk a little bit about is access scopes when it comes to the Epic account login. These access scopes are actually super important because it's what the player is willing to grant your game to access. So keep these scopes in mind when it, when it comes time to actually build your game. If you're looking to access online presence or friends or country information, make sure those scopes are enabled. There's definitely times where we've seen titles that are launching and they're trying to access or call these operations and they're failing and it's because these scopes have not been granted. So make sure there's a one-to-one -one relationship in what is my SDK actually asking for in the code initialization and what have I set up on my backend? Because if there's a mismatch, you're gonna get some, you're gonna get errors and players are going to be unable to log in. All right, a little bit when it comes to EOS Connect specifically and how to manage EOS Connect. One of the most common issues that we see is people forgetting that you have to renew your authentication into the EOS backend. The EOS Connect backend has a one hour time limit with whatever access token it's provided, whatever, whether, whether that be an Epic account, Xbox account, whatever, after an hour, you need to give it a fresh access token or access will, will expire. And you'll probably get report tickets from players that saying, I can't unlock achievements after playing for an hour or I'm kicked from the matchmaking service. We do have a callback to notify you when it's about to expire. So it's not too difficult to track. Just make sure you hook up that callback. And then on that time, re-log into the US backend. Please make sure to do that. It'll save yourself a lot of troubleshooting in the future. Now, one of the things that is worth calling out is essentially PUID management. I talked about how you log in with an account, we use the PUID on the back end to identify a user, and you want to be conscious of how PUIDs are managed. So let me talk through a little bit of a flow. And again, this kind of ties back to that whole Epic account, not knowing about Xbox and the flow thing here. If you've got a cross-platform game, and we're talking about from a Steam context, you need to think about how and when your player will engage with your game. So for example, I said, if you're going to support Epic account login on external platforms, make it an option. What will probably happen in this flow is a player logs in to your game. You'll take that external identity, say Steam, log into the EOS backend. It creates a PUID to represent the user. What you need to think about then is what if they then later access the game from either another platform or log in with an Epic account? You don't want to create a new PUID because that represents a new user. So you need to think about either having some sort of UI that says, have you played this game before? That way they can log in and you can link the backends or making sure to do that linking directly. Sometimes we see cases where titles will forget about this relationship, do login with native platform, do login with Epic account, have two different PUIDs and then try sending invites. And they're like, the invites aren't working and it's because it's sending it to the wrong user because they don't realize they're the same, the same player. So when you have this flow, keep this flow, when you have this flow, keep these things in mind. Say, okay, 
Could a player log in from an external platform? Can we make sure to associate with the same PUID? Or are they logging in on the same platform and link those PUIDs? Remember, PUID and deployment information is how data is passed. So if you have cross progression, you want to make sure that that information is preserved. All right, let's talk about crossplay. So this is specific to the store, but in the world of Fortnite and modern games, we really are seeing kind of this surge of games supporting crossplay in general. So I'd like to think Epic is one of those front runners in terms of how to do these things with best practices. So hopefully you can take something from this. It's worth breaking down some ideas while also talking about our specific store requirements. Again, none of these things are required, but if you do ship on the Epic Game Store, we require crossplay. We don't require use of EOS and EAS. We think it does a pretty good job of solving these things. So I'm going to talk in that context. But when you have a multiplayer game and you want to ship on the store, the first thing to keep in mind is that you need a common, match common matchmaking backend or a common player pool for everybody. All right? So it doesn't matter where I log in. All the players are in the same multiplayer pool. What doesn't work is, or what we, what we don't like seeing is a player log in and kind of start in a fragmented experience and then have an option to opt in because then what they're doing is they're logging into a smaller player set and just having less friends to play with. When it comes to the Epic Game Store, one of the things that is probably the more common confusion is the invites experience. You've got a matchmaking pool that's the same, but if I have the ability to see friends and send invites to them on other storefronts, we require that you have some way to do a similar invite in across storefront boundaries. The one question we always get that doesn't meet the requirement is, can I do lobby codes in this instance? And the answer is no. You want a similar way to invite and see friends. How you do that is up to you. One of the most common solutions we see is the ability to log into an Epic account as a common social graph across all platforms to send and receive invites across platforms. It's worth noting that when we require crossplay, we don't require it with consoles. Um, we do recognize that there are cases where that could be a consideration, especially with like shooters, and also the requirements to ship crossplay on consoles is a little bit more, a little more more complicated than just doing it, say versus PC with Steam and Epic. Um, but we'd love to see you support that as well, and EOS does support that out of the gate. Finally, I do want to mention as well, if you're doing if you're supporting crossplay, we don't want players to feel obligated to again have an Epic account and be forced to install the Epic launcher. We have an overlay tech that we ship, and we have a redistributable that you can build with your game. So make sure to include those things versus trying to tie it back to the platform experience, because that just doesn't feel good. So let's look at a couple of examples of how titles have supported crossplay, because I like visual things from time to time. So I have three titles here that I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is a game called Speed Brawl. You'll see here that, again, launch the game. There's a button to link the Epic account. Pretty easy to log in. It'll trigger a flow, and I'll show that flow in a second. Midnight Ghost Hunt, it's actually just a setting, so I didn't really have a good way to capture it. Um, but this is a really cool game if you like the ghost, ghost, Ghostbusters kind of vibe of um, players versus ghosts. Uh, I, I think it's asymmetrical, if I remember correctly, but a lot of fun. Um, but you enable a setting, enables login for crossplay, and allows players to play together. It's something that you can enable and disable. And then one more recently that I really love, because this shipped full crossplay with console and PC back in February, is Remnant 2. Really, really fun game. You may not be able to see it, but if you look in the top right, there's actually a button in the PlayStation UI and also Xbox UI that says Link an Epic Account. And this was a really exciting time for them because it just really exploded the player numbers as suddenly there was a huge new swath of players to play with. Walking through what that login flow will look like, all handled through our overlay tech. You click login. In this case, it doesn't actually recognize that the PlayStation account in question has an associated Epic account, so it asks you to sign in. Once you've signed in, in future, you can use that PlayStation, PlayStation account to log in with the Epic account. This is probably one of the flows that catches people. This is that consent flow with brand settings that I was talking about. Again, saying, do I allow this application to access my Epic account information? This is a required consent flow for players that you may not see with other platforms because most of them are scoped within their same, same platform identity, whereas Epic accounts can be everywhere. So this is an OK flow. If, You've never seen it because you bought from the Epic Game Store. It's because we capture that consent automatically, but it should only happen once, assuming you've configured everything correctly. Once you do that, you get this nice little notification, players logged in, and you get access to Epic information and Epic accounts in your game. How does that actually work? Again, there's kind of two main approaches. You can have some sort of UI to handle that flow for you, 
or in the case of something like Midnight Ghost Hunt or Remnant 2, they're using our overlay tech. And you can actually see that in this case on Steam, my Steam friends list and my Epic friends list is actually combined. One of the re recent updates we had is this idea of integrated platform, which will take the native platform's friends and make it so that you can see and send and receive invites through the overlay itself. Um, so here's an example of Steam. And then our friends on Remnant with PlayStation is the same. If this dev account had friends, they would show up here, but they don't, so sorry. All right. So a lot of ta talks about EOS. I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about any cheat and player moderation, because this is one of those newer areas that's probably newer to the conversation space, but is actually super valuable to your game. If you're not familiar with it, Easy Any Cheat is a free service provided as part of our suite of tools. Yes, EOS is free. It's targeted mainly towards shooters and competitive action games, but it's actually valuable in a number of scenarios. In particular, EAC provides protection for both game installations as well as process memory when a game is running. It will detect attempts to modify either of those things. One thing that's also worth mentioning is that it's not a solution for offline games. This is something we get questions about a lot. It's scoped for basically operations to be communicating with a backend server. So anything that's running on the local machine is something we really can't control. So just keep that in mind. If it's local to the client and offline, there's no guarantees. It's also worth mentioning as well that cheating in general is no longer just this idea of a bedroom hacker going into your game. It's a multi-million dollar industry that has entire companies and professional developers dedicated to circumventing game protection and giving advantages to, say, pay-to-win players or to customers. Um, some cheats make it even provide subscription services. So it's an ever-running arms race. And something to keep in mind is that you'll be forever wanting the latest and greatest. So we use a module system that you can download to get new cheat detections. And the advantage of this is we'll be able to pull whatever information we've got into your game. And you do this all from the developer portal. Um, also, because of that, you need to really think about anti-cheat early. You want to have this process built in. It's not something you can really tack on at the end and have it be successfully effective. Um, use it in your testing, use it in your open betas, try to break your own game. We see a lot of developers that are ready to ship. Then they think about easy any cheat and it's just more time that they weren't accounting for and not as effective as they wanted. This is a big one as well. You set up any cheat, but there are scenarios that you know are bad, that you know could be cheated, but that the, that the tech isn't detecting it. And that's because the engine potentially allows it. And so this is where player reporting comes in. Your players are going, your honest players are going to give you the reports of what's going on in your game. And they're an essential part of the whole process. Uh, and they can actually do things that, again, an anti-cheat can't do. For example, if your game engine allows a player to cheat maybe by clipping through an edge and hiding in the environment, that's not actually a cheat based on the back end. It's technically allowed in your game. EAC won't detect it, but it's obviously a hack and a cheat. And that's where player reports come in because you can use that to collaborate with your own data to actually find things that can be fixed. The developer portal will help take these reports and create a dashboard and analytics to allow you to identify cheat activity and use it for your own moderation purposes. And then we apply moderation as well um, based on automatic things. Now, finally, this isn't a silver bullet. EAC will not solve all your problems. We're all developers. We understand that just hacking in general, once something is live, it's going to be hacked. It's about creating kind of a barrier to make it a little bit more difficult than the other guy. So think like a cheat maker when designing your games. I've got some ideas here that you can consider. Uh, there's plenty more. Just take steps, again, from the beginning to harden your design, and it will at least slow down the ability to crack your game uh, and allow you time to analyze your game for exploits during maybe that early launch window, which is probably the most critical to PR. I'm sure, we've all, I'm sure you've all seen titles that had a lot of promise but had cheating problems early, and it kind of hurt the reputation and launch of the game. All right, last major topic. I know we're at UE Fest, so let's talk a little bit about Unreal Engine and integrating EOS into the Unreal, Unreal Engine. If you're not familiar, the online subsystem is a provided plugin that we have, and it creates a common interface across different platforms to make it easier for you to integrate, regardless of what you're interacting with. By switching the OSS settings used, games can be made to work on any platform without modifying any of kind of the underlying code. Games only need to interact with 
a standardized interface provided by the OSS, and then we take care of the, the actual platform-specific inter interactions. For the US OSS, it's actually pretty easy to integrate. You enable it in the plugin settings and restart, and then add a few configurations into your dependency model modules. It's ready to go. Final piece you need is a few IDs to initialize the SDK. The, NI, the INI file is how you can toggle things on or off, and it's necessary to configure things like the network driver. Um, by setting up that driver provided by the online subsystem, it allows for any, things like P2P communication. Otherwise, we can't use EOS's P2P service. So keep that in mind if you're looking to do that. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning is we've kind of focused on EOS and PC, but as you probably gathered, we work across platforms. So um, we do have the ability to support multiple platforms, even in the OSS. Uh, there may be some requirements that you have on consoles to display console-specific information, so it's possible to address these requirements by using EOS OSS in conjunction with whatever that platform native one is. Um, and you manage that through, today, EOS Plus uh, for the default platform service and the platform name uh, of the native platform. And so you can use things like the US calls and then make and then switch to the platform native interface to make the native calls that you need to, and you can switch between them using the Git subsystem call. Um, things are changing, by the way. US Plus is planned to be deprecated as we've released updates to the US SDK. It's worth noting that you're probably going to see some changes in some of these new changes and things, um, and you can actually make a lot of these calls going forward with just the EOS OSS. And so you don't need to use EOS Plus. And then looking further in the future, uh, not yet, um, while EOS is actually super nice to do a lot of common calls, it's worth noting that we don't cover all functionality. Um, one of the classic examples tying back to ownership entitlements is the EOS OSS today only supports the query entitlements operation, but cannot call query ownership. So this is a case where you'll actually need to grab the native platform to make the SDK calls directly. So that's something, it's probably why a lot of titles are making the wrong call. It's because they're just using the OSS, but keep it in mind that you can grab the platform handle and just make the calls necessary into your game to do things like ownership or any cheat. To call the US SDK directly, you just need to know the user of the, the user, and here's how you can grab it with a uh, F unique net ID so you can convert it into a PUID format because again, the PUID is how we identify all users. Um, if you are using EOS Plus today, the I unique net ID EOS Plus is the right class to cast and then you'll need a different one to get the PUID and the Epic account ID because it will combine them by default on the back end. And this is what I wanted, this was our, what I was gonna talk about. It's worth noting that we are looking to move to OSS 2.0 um, to make a lot of these things even better. It's not something we have a concrete timeline for today, but it will replace some of these some of these operations and hopefully include improvements like ownership calls in the future. So keep an eye out, uh, keep aware, but I wanted to let you know that that thing is coming. All right, it's a lot of information. Quick slide, here's what we're looking at doing right now. Um, if you haven't heard, we're planning on shipping the Epic Games Store on mobile, so all focus is on that and EOS is going to be along for the ride as we take this opportunity to look at what are things that maybe we're not supporting today, but especially what will we need to support the mobile ecosystem. And so that'll be a lot of the focus of what we're going to build out EOS to support and also base it on your feedback. But things like parties, chat support, better player experiences, better player connectivity, especially as we move into a mobile ecosystem. Obviously mobile features will be valid. And then just general improvements all up, things like user profiles that I hope will come next year um, will be something that you can include. That's a lot of information. I want to take some time to have a Q&A, but thank you guys for bearing with me as I dig into things that I hope was insightful and you can use in your own development.